Thank you for tuning in to Entertain the Geeky, your source for nerd news. Hey guys, what's up? This is Jason back at you with more nerd news. Um, so, it's been a huge, huge week this week, and I know I seem to say that every week, but it just gets bigger and bigger. Uh, <laughs> um, so, I'm going to just bring you some of the stories that are popping up and making headlines this week. Um, so, we'll start right here. Uh, Gotham is getting into the end of its fourth season here and I talked about this a little bit uh, you know a couple weeks ago but I, I really do think that um, you know I've never been the biggest supporter of Gotham but I really do think something's happening lately that is changing my perspective on it um, we've seen more and more of the iconic Batman villains um, they are building to uh, a big no man's land uh, event within the narrative of their show. Uh, they recently brought in the Joker, and this one, this one that came out this week, um, this episode that aired Thursday. And again, while I don't watch the show, I do keep up because I, you know that's just my job. I like to keep up. I like to even know what's going on, even with things that I'm not particularly interested in watching. Um, but I think I'm changing my tune a little bit here because uh, early on in the fourth season, Bruce. Um, was responsible for the death of Ra's al Ghul, or at least Gotham's version of Ra's al Ghul. Um, but this issue, this episode, um, brings him back. Uh, he pops back up because you know apparently they needed because Bruce was the one that killed him. They needed Bruce's blood to resurrect him, um, and he he makes some cryptic remarks after taking back control of the demon's head. Um, he speaks of the cataclysmic event to come, obviously referencing the finale and their no man's land attempt. Um, but he also says that he was hoping to stay alive so that he could prepare Bruce to be the dark knight of Gotham. Now, to any, <coughs> excuse me, to any Batman fan, um, immediately you think, well, he's going to help him become Batman, which Ra's al Ghul in some tellings of the story has been a mentor to Bruce when he was training and when he was becoming Batman or becoming the man that would be Batman. Um, so this kind of goes hand in hand with uh, something that we touched on uh, on the show a couple weeks ago about how the creators have said that this, the end of this season will serve as the end of the show as we know it and that the, f the start of the following season will kind of almost be a soft reboot of the show's continuity. Um, still going on with the, obviously the same actors and the same villains, but it looks like um, if what we believe with Ra's al Ghul, seeing the Joker pop up for the first time here um, and, and building to the No Man's Land, which in the comics shook the very foundations of Gotham um, and what it was and, and what it would become in the future, um, Seems like maybe we're finally going to get that Batman show that uh, I think some of us kind of always hoped Gotham would be, even back when there was whispers, um, before we even knew what the show was. Um, we were all kind of hoping that it would be our our, our prequel Batman story. Um, me, personally, I don't think that the idea of bringing in the villains before bringing in Batman was the best choice. Um but there it is, you know. It's it, you know they they write the show, they write it how they want, and it's popular. I mean, it's it's about to conclude its fourth season. They've made obviously some detailed plans for what the fifth season will be. So, fingers crossed. I mean, I you know I, I want to like Bat. I love Batman as a character, so I want to like things that have Batman in them. But I just haven't really found much to be interested in in Gotham um, up until very recently. Um, switching over. Excuse me. Switching over to the comic world, um, obviously the big thing with Marvel um, is they're they're finally going to bring back the Fantastic Four. I mean, this has been something that's kind of been a long time coming, but um, it seems as with the uh, you know the acquisition of 20th Century Fox that we are done hiding the Fantastic Four out in the multiverse somewhere, and we're going to bring them back. Um, we talked about this a couple of weeks on the show, but some interesting new things have come up as we get nearer to the release of this comic book. Um, the first thing is uh, a look at what will probably be the costumes, the newer costumes, on a cover for Fantastic Four number one that's uh, being done by Isad Ribic. Um, he is going to be doing the covers for uh, Fantastic Four, while Sarah Pacelli will be doing the interiors. Um, and the costumes, I mean, right away they're they're kind of a you know a darker blue. Um, they kind of have a you know kind of more. Uh, 
I don't know, designs and, and various looks, kind of angular looks. Um, the costumes still look very much like Fantastic Four costumes that we've come to expect, um, but they're definitely, uh, you know, using a darker blue as opposed to, like, the brighter blue and the black. We've now got a darker blue and black, um, and they're just a little more stylized, and we'll see. I mean, all, all we've seen so far is, obviously, you know, Isad Ribic's uh, cover for the book, um, what Sarah Pacelli does and how she... Um, you know, chooses to kind of show them in her own particular art style um, might be very different from what we see on the cover. But I imagine at least some of it will remain intact and that the redesign is something that everybody was kind of had a hand in, um, at least all from, from the artistic team standpoint. Um, we also got news this week. Uh, they expanded upon the teaser with just the four of them and, and, and the writer and artist at the top. Um, they expanded upon that and now have included uh, Franklin and Valeria, which are Reed and Sue's children. Uh, Reed and Sue's son and daughter. Um, and I guess, you know, with, with what happened in the aftermath of Secret Wars, I guess we kind of all just assumed that Franklin and Valeria would be a part of this story. Um, but it's nice to, you know, it's nice to, to, to get some confirmation to see them uh, included in the lineup of characters uh, for the teasers for the new Fantastic Four series. Um, so looking forward to that. I mean, honestly, I have, there's, there's, you know, there hasn't been anything to be excited about when it comes to Fantastic Four. Um, and there have definitely been some good runs over the year. I think Jonathan Hickman um, did a fantastic job with the characters uh, building his Fantastic Four and into FF uh, after the death of Johnny Storm. Um, so there's definitely been good stories. I mean, it's never been, you know, at the forefront of my comic love, but it is something that's always worth checking out, especially um, when you uh, when you assemble a good team. So, be looking forward to that. Um, moving over into the video game world, uh, this week, Star Wars Battlefront 2 um, reintroduced its microtransactions. Um, you know, obviously, we've talked about this on the show before. Um, way back at the beginning, uh, they, right before the game's launch, uh, took out the kind of loot crate system. Um, because it, it was just a, the, the fan backlash was too great. Um, but essentially what it once what it was at the beginning was this idea that you could pay for these randomized things that would make your you know give you boost to your stats or uh, different weapon loadouts um, or just various uh, skins for characters and things like that um, so essentially allowing you you know you could grind it out and and get the points and use those um, but most people um, chose to you know in those in those situations choose to spend their money um, real world currency um, to get some some video game loot which I I've never really understood um, and I, I'm not gonna say that I've never done that because I have spent money on on video games before for content within the game but uh, it, it just seems it seems like the progression that I can take to get there on my own should be balanced with the with the loot crate system um so obviously they took the microtransactions out of the game entirely and everybody had to just go into grinding and 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 trying to get the uh, the points to buy their upgrades the old-fashioned way um but this week they reintroduced the microtransaction system um with a caveat it is going to be purely cosmetic now um the spending money will really just get you um skins uh various different alien species to play as within the game um various iconic characters to play as different versions of you know kylo ren and yoda um and some of these other characters so that i can that i that i think is nice right you can spend your money to run around as a as a Koreen or spend your money to run around as a Wookiee. Um, just kind of an interesting, those are the kind of things I would spend money on, right? To get a cool skin or, or get a cool character to play the game as. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to upgrading your weaponry and getting new, new stat boosts and loadouts, you should have to play the game to get those things. Not just turn the game on, spend your money, and in a couple hours, you're the best guy in the game world. So, uh, you know, I... I Hopefully, this was, you know, a, a learning curve for EA, and a lesson has been learned about what fans want and what fans need out of video games. I mean, at, the, at first, we all kind of bought into what the the idea of this was in our games, but we're starting to wise up and realizing that you're just you're just making you're just making games where you you can spend your money to be really good at the game, and that's not fair to people who you know either can't afford to do that um, or just choose not to, like myself, and just try to enjoy the game for what it is. Um, so 
hopefully, you know, EA has learned a lesson, and going forward, things will be different. Um, sticking in the game, uh, in the video game world, um, a big update, big big update. <laughs> And I say that as a joke because the update is a large monster. Um, but Monster Hunter World got update 3.0 this week, um, which introduced uh, a new target to hunt, uh, an elder dragon called Kulve Taroth, um, which is cool enough you know, all by itself, um, if you're a Monster Hunter fan. I mean, I've not played the games personally, um, but I've seen various playthroughs, I watched the videos, because I think it looks like something that, from a multiplayer standpoint, would be fun, getting, you know, a group of friends together, each of us on our respective couches, uh, and we go into this world to hunt down a monster. I think that's a very interesting idea. Um, something that came along with the release of the new... Uh, dragon to hunt in the game was a new area, the area that he uh, inhabits, and the ability to temporarily, um, for this week only, um, team up with 15 of your friends um, into four four-man units uh, to hunt the Elder Dragon. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, obviously, they're, they're, they put this feature in and they're taking it back out again. It was just kind of to celebrate this, this update. Um, but the folks... The folks behind the game have promised us that this will be something that is added back in at a later date um, as a full feature for the game. Um, they were just kind of using this this new dragon um, in the world as kind of a beta test, I think, for this 16-player, uh, you know, four-man four squad thing going in and hunting monsters. Um, so if you're a fan of Monster Hunter World, big, big things are coming. Uh, they're just continuing to expand the game. Um, and keep your eyes open, because that 16-player thing will be back around. Um, Moving over into the world of movies, uh, this was a really cool announcement. Um, Victoria Mahoney, and uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with her, she was, she's done various television things, um, some Law & Order stuff. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure a lot of her television shows, but the big things, uh, she just directed A Wrinkle in Time and uh, New Gods, um, which were both big movies in their own right. Um, and she has been brought on uh, to direct the second unit uh, for Star Wars Episode Nine, um, and that's huge. I mean, that's that's just a huge thing. We really thought that J.J. Abrams was going to be kind of spearheading all of this on his own and trying to continue what Ryan Johnson did with uh, with Episode Eight, um, but it looks like um, he he needs Victoria Mahoney's perspective for his second unit. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, the second unit is actually a pretty important thing within the film because it's responsible for establishing shots. Um, stunts, um, various cutaways, wipes, dissolves, those kinds of things. The things that kind of help the narrative move at a good pace. Um, so very, very key points uh, in, in the movie-making world. Um, and it looks like Victoria Mahoney is going to get her time to shine as a Star Wars director, um, which is fantastic. I just I cannot wait to see it because, honestly, I'm not with everybody uh, out there who might not have enjoyed Episode Eight. Um, I thought The Last Jedi was fantastic, and I look forward to seeing how we bring it all to its conclusion in, uh, in Episode 9. Um, so back over in the world of comics, this week saw the release of Action Comics number 1000. So big, big, huge, um, big, big, huge release in the world of Action Comics, uh, the story that's been going on since... I believe 1938 was 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 when the story initially launched. Um, but among its various stories, kind of what it did, um, you know, story-wise, was change something very big about uh, very big about Superman and about the Superman mythos. Um, and leave it to Brian Michael Bendis to come in, uh, take over writing, and immediately retcon some things. Um, the big, big retcon came in one of the short stories. Um, we were introduced to an alien who Superman and Supergirl teamed up to fight called Rolgal Zar. Um, and we, we kind of go through this whole issue. Superman's unconscious for a little bit of it. Um, Lois and Jimmy kind of drag him to safety and comment. Jimmy makes comments about his, uh, his, his red trunks are back, um, which obviously was a joke that had to be in there because they made such a big deal about that. Um... But, uh, so Supergirl kind of tackles with Rogal Zar, and it's not until Superman comes back into the fray that we understand who Rogal Zar is. Um, apparently, he is an alien that has such a hatred for Kryptonians and what they represent in the universe that he actually set in motion the series of events that ultimately led to Krypton's destruction. 
Um, he claims, if, if these claims are to be believed, if he's not just kind of blowing smoke, which I guess we'll find out as, uh, as Bendis' new Superman run kind of, you know, starts uh, next month, but um, he claims to have been the one that wiped out Krypton, and now he's here on Earth to take care of the last Kryptonians that he missed. Um, and this is not something that's new within the Superman world. Um, Superman Earth-1 um, by J. Michael Straczynski. Um, Straczynski wrote in a story for the, the Earth-1 version of Superman where an entire alien race of, of hunters, killers, was hired to destroy Krypton. And in order to receive their payment, they had to go to Earth to get the last Kryptonian. Um, so this is not something that is new, the idea being changed that... Um, that Krypton, that wasn't just a natural disaster, that it wasn't some kind of random occurrence, um, that it actually was acted upon by an outside force. Um, so, if again, if the aliens' words are to be believed, we've got uh, some interesting new Superman continuity being built already by Bendis, who literally has just taken over writing the character. Um, sticking with the world of comics... Diamond, uh, you know, uh, Diamond Comic Distribution is the distributor in uh, in North America. It is the distributor to uh, parts, you know, of uh, the rest of the world as well. Um, it's become a giant in the world of comic distribution. Um, and occasionally they do this, and it bothers me every time. I get it, right? Usually, you know, hiding things, keeping keeping everything on the hush-hush until the announcements are made and the deals are done. But in the most recent Marvel previews released by Marvel and Diamond, there is a new X-book that has been previewed, um, and it literally is called X-Classified Number 1. And I, I don't think that X Classified is the title. I think that they are just having a laugh at us because the writer is classified, the artist is classified, the cover artist is classified. In fact, the only couple of things that are not classified are a couple of the variant covers, one being done by J. Scott Campbell um, and one being done by someone else. I'm, I'm forgetting that who the other cover is. But most of the information is redacted. Um, and what this usually means, I mean, if you follow the comic world and you kind of keep up with the news, um, as I am wont to do, this usually means that they are going to save the announcement for some kind of major media outlet um, and let them kind of break the story. Um, and that's fine. That's all well and good. I just really don't, I really just think it's, you know, it's it's trying to create false buzz about something. And it ends up just kind of me as a, as a fan and someone who keeps an, up, keeps an eye on the previous books to see what's coming. Um, it really just doesn't do much for me. It really just kind of bothers, you know, my my sensibilities and, and my love of this. Wait until the announcement is made and then give me a preview of it. It just seems like that's the way we've done it so long, and it's worked out just fine. <laughs> but um, there is speculation, you know, this could be the relaunched Uncanny X-Men, um, or it could be another color uh, book that fits in with the red, blue, gold thing that they've got going on. Um, there was rumor at one point about a series that was going to be titled X-Men Black that was going to be kind of a new X-Force book. Um, so that could be this as well. We'll uh, we'll find out. I'm sure they'll leak it to some news outlet and they'll kind of break the story about a new X book. Um, switching over into the world of movies, uh, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of the DC uh, extended universe, but it looks like it has just picked up a pretty high profile director um, to direct a movie that might feel very different from the things they've done up to this point. Um, Steven Spielberg has been brought on to direct, uh, apparently, a Black Hawk movie. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with the Black Hawks, they were a World War I fighter pilot squadron led by Black Hawk. Um, and they, uh, through some weird time travel-y nonsense that you know, comic, the comic world is, is famous for, uh, this, a couple of their members were brought into the present day and that's where we got some of those characters. But, um, so, you know, Steven Spielberg is an interesting choice because again, if you're doing this as an origin story and going to try to work it into the larger narrative later, um, this could be something that's right up his alley. I mean, I'm immediately drawn back to saving private Ryan. Whenever I think of Steven Spielberg and war movies, the man just knows how to shoot a war movie. The man knows how to shoot a battle. Um, he knows how to frame things. There's a reason he's won awards. There's a reason he's been at the top of his game for most of my life. Um, the man just understands how scene progression works. He understands how lighting works. He just he understands how slow motion and drama for a scene works. He's just a fantastic filmmaker. Um, 
And honestly, again, not the biggest fan of the DCEU, but I think Steven Spielberg directing a Black Hawk movie might be worth checking out. Um, we'll have to wait and see for further announcements. Um, it's kind of just right at the beginning of its rumor at this point. Um, but we'll, we'll keep following that here on Entertain the Geeky and keep you up to date on whether or not we're going to get such a high-profile director to direct a DC movie. Um, switching back over into the comic world, um, Tony Daniel, who has drawn Batman, even written Batman stories for so long during the pre-New 52 you know, runs, and then during New 52 he was doing Detective Comics, um, he's been a, a Batman writer and artist uh, for a long, long time. And he's looks like he's back with the character. Um, Tom King's Batman will now have shared artist responsibilities between uh, Tony Daniel and uh, Mikkel Janine, who is uh, doing the uh, doing the interiors for the book now. Um, and this is a big deal. I mean, whether you're a fan of Tony Daniel's art, I personally think that he is kind of a little too heavy with the inking of his stuff, which tends to kind of make his characters stand out a little too boldly um, on his panels and kind of look a little unrealistic. Um, you can't deny the man's talent. The man is a fantastic artist. Um, and he's even been a great writer. Some of the stuff that he's written for Batman over the years has been fantastic. So having him back on the book uh, is great. He actually did an interview at a convention saying that he hopes to stay on the book for 50 issues um, or more. He just he really loves drawing the character. He's really enjoying working with Tom King. Um his first official issue is Batman number 45, which is leading up to our big wedding in Batman 50, um, but Batman 45 starts us on a crazy time travel story that involves Booster Gold and another universe, and it's just good fun, um, and it's great to see a, you know, an old hat at the game like Tony Daniel uh, coming back and doing, a, doing the character again. Um, so this one... Is, is a huge, huge spoiler. Um, not as of yet, but it could be a huge spoiler for Avengers 4. Um, it turns out that Emma Furman um, may, and, and again, this is a big may, no uh, you know, official confirmation has come, um, but may be playing a teenage version of Cassie Lang in Avengers 4 which is still as of yet untitled. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with Cassie Lang, she is Scott Lang's daughter. We have seen her in Ant-Man. Uh, we will see her in Ant-Man and the Wasp. And it looks like a teenage version of her has been cast as her superhero counterpart, Stature. Um, and if you you know Ant-Man and the Wasp, you know she's got her, her tech and she can shrink and, and grow big and stuff like that. Um, this could be, again, though, a huge potential spoiler um, because if true, it seems to confirm the fact that Avengers 4 will have time travel. Um, whether or not that will be our heroes time traveling, whether or not that will be Thanos using the time stone, whether it be with Doctor Strange alone trying to go back and, and alter events to save the world, who knows? Um, Avengers Infinity War is literally about four days away now, um, so we should have at least some answers when we, uh, when we see that film. But again, take this with a grain of salt, but if true, could be a huge confirmation for some of the time travel theories we've seen about Avengers 4. Um, real quick, before we get out of here, just something that popped up that I thought was really, really funny. Um, I personally am a fan of Rick and Morty. I would assume some of you listening out there are as well. Um, and they had probably, I would say, one of the most random cameos you could possibly have for the two characters. Uh, they popped up this week in an episode of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. And yes, it was pony versions of Rick and of Morty. Um, and this just... <laughs> some fans of the show are a little weirded out by that. Some fans of the show are even a little upset by that. Fans of Rick and Morty, though, we uh, we kind of understand that the way that show works with this giant multiverse is that Rick and Morty could just be everywhere and anywhere. I mean, there's a version of Rick and Morty here in our reality, probably. <laughs> um, that's just how the show works. So seeing them pop up in a different reality, and especially seeing them pop up as the denizens of that reality and that reality is not something new to Rick and Morty fans. We've seen it plenty of times, um, and it was just kind of a fun little cameo that popped up. And personally, I'm not a, I'm not a brony not a my little pony friendship is magic fan but i did have to uh hit the internet and uh and check out that clip of rick and morty in uh, my little pony friendship is magic i suggest you do the same because it was actually pretty funny um that's going to bring us to the end 
So, uh, if you dig what we're putting down here, do me a favor and head on over to entertainthegeeky.com. we got the blog posts there. We've got the nerd news blurbs. we got all the shows. Entertain the Geeky with, with Chris and Roger. Nerd news. Uh, we've got board game bros with Matt and Jeff. They are brothers. They play board games. They talk about board games. Their show is great. Check them out there as well. Um, if you're local and you're a fan, um, keep in mind that we are going to be at Miniature Market on May the 20th. It is a Sunday. Um, the Miniature Market is now out at... Um, a miniature market retail location is now at uh, 270 in Manchester. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful store. The staff is super friendly. Um, we're going to be hosting a demo event in there on the 20th. So don't forget about that. Um, early June, we are going to be launching the Kickstarter for Conniving Cooks. We're really proud of this one, guys. We're really trying to get EG Games off the ground, um, and we need your help. Um, so we will be sometime in June um, launching the Kickstarter. We will coincide that launch with a demo day where we'll have copies of the game, come out to Miniature Market, try the game out, and if you like it, help us out because we really want to get EG Games off the ground and bring some of our interesting ideas uh, to you, our fans. Um, you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash entertainmentgeeky. If Twitter is more your social media speed, we are there as well at entertaingeeky. And if you want to chat with me, talk to me about the show, what you think of what we're doing here, um, shoot me an email at etgnerdnews at gmail.com. I'm going to talk with you guys next time. Um, we are getting ready to watch Avengers Infinity War this week. We will have a, a spoiler review. It will be a spoiler review. Keep that in mind. If you're going to click on it, it's going to have spoilers uh, that me and Joe will do. Um, and until then, man, guys, stay geeky.